Good morning, I'm Jason Salagi. Before we jump into our topic for the day, I'd like to take a moment to express our deep sympathies for the people of Israel after the heinous attack over the weekend of October 7th and 8th, 2023. This is going to be a special episode of History with the Salagis. Uh, it may very well turn out to be several episodes, but this is just to kind of give some generalized background of the situation that's taking place uh, in the Middle East at the moment. Um, so what we're going to do today is a little bit different than the usual uh, scripted episodes that we go with. In this case, uh, we're just going to go through, talk about some basic concepts of what is going on in the Middle East, what is Israel, what is Palestine, how did the modern state of Israel come to be, what are the conditions uh, and conflict between the Israelis and Palestinians, what the generalized history has been since roughly, we'll talk a little bit before World War I, uh, up to at least uh, 2022, give some background on what some of the Palestinian uh, government and Palestinian uh, terrorist groups are uh, when they were formed, what their mission is, and discuss the fact that this is uh, an issue that has been with us for the better part of 100 years, and it is something that has not generally been very well pushed to a conclusion that will be amicable for all sides involved. So this is not uh, a statement uh, of support for either side. Obviously, uh, the terrorist attacks are horrific uh, that were conducted by Hamas, uh, but in the same sense, there is uh, additional context for why this happened. Uh, this is a period, uh, this is actually a series of events that are not necessarily black and white. They are areas of gray, and they are channeled by events that have been either ignored or pushed off to the side for decades, not just by Israelis and Palestinians, but by the rest of the world at large as well. So we'll jump into some basic background. Uh, given that there's obvious conflict between these groups, why do they live in the same place? Okay, so this is the region that we're talking about uh, is Israel or Palestine, uh, depending on which country you see as the legitimate uh, entity in this region. Historically, the region that we're looking at uh, is uh, Israel. It is a Jewish homeland. This is where the early Hebrews settled. And what ends up happening is that they end up uh, founding two different kingdoms. There's the kingdom of Israel in the northern part of the territory and the kingdom of Judah in the south. The early Israelites are different when you look at them compared to other people living in the region uh, at the time. We don't have a concrete date for when the Israelites arrive in the region. Uh, historians argue many different theories. Uh, some think that the Israelites were a group of people who always lived in this particular area, but over the time they were able to basically uh, assimilate the region and uh, form their own nation. Another theory is that they were migratory that they did not start out initially in this particular region, but moved in over the course of generations and settled the land. There's really no way, one way or the other, to determine which of these theories is accurate uh, at the time. So this is a point of contention. The earliest that we really see uh, the Israelites showing up in the records would be around the 11th and 10th century BCE. So you're looking at maybe 1000 BCE to 900 BCE. That's where we get basically uh, corroboration from outside the, that particular state, where you see it's going to be the Neo-Assyrians and the Neo-Hittites and the Neo-Babylonians and the Egyptians eventually making note of the fact that this these kingdoms of Israel and Judah are in this region and that they are trade partners, they're allies, and in many cases they will be subjugated by the surrounding cultures. The Israelites are different in many, different, in many ways, significant ways, 
compared to the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Babylonians, the ancient Assyrians, many of the peoples in the ancient Near East, mostly because of their religious identity, which becomes part of their uh, ethnic identity. And that is that they are monotheistic, meaning that they only believe in one God, that God being Yahweh. The Israelites and Yahweh have a covenant or a series of covenants, a series of pacts, where so long as they do not worship other deities, they are a chosen people. They're protected by Yahweh. The first of the patriarchs or fathers of the Israelites who end up making this pact, his name is Abram or Abraham, and he is considered the father uh, of the monotheistic religions. He is a patriarch of not only the Jewish people, but also Christians and Muslims. He was from the city of Ur. He and his wife and his family, he was basically given this promise that if he and his family left Ur, which would have been in ancient Mesopotamia or modern-day Iraq, and moved west and only worshipped Yahweh, then he and his people, and his descendants especially, would be a great nation among the earth. Every other civilization in the area at the time was polytheistic, meaning that they believed in many different gods and goddesses, many different spirits. Uh, in order for uh, humans to survive, the relationship in a lot of the polytheistic religions is rather subservient, where the humans are there to basically please the gods in order to make sure that there are not catastrophes that are going to destroy them. Yahweh is different, though. Uh, while it is a strict monotheistic religion, there is a sense of humanism to it. It is the decision of the people who are Israelites, who are part of this covenant, to live up to the agreement, the pact themselves on a personal level. That is different uh, than most of the polytheistic religions. That is going to be a major stamp that stays with uh, monotheistic religions, the idea of... Uh, to a degree, free will. The idea that it is humans who their actions is whether they will be punished or rewarded in an afterlife. Another thing that Judaism puts in to really the human mindset is the idea of time. It changes the way that people look at how the cycle of the world and the cycle of time happens. Polytheistic religions are generally what we see as cyclical meaning that they just keep repeating over and over again. Uh, when the cycle comes to an end, much like a circle, it just starts back over again. And so there's this never-ending timeline where events just repeat over and over again. And in many cases, they're already predetermined. With Judaism and later Christianity and Islam, you break away from the cyclical time cycle. And instead, you go to a linear one where there is a beginning, which is the creation of everything. Uh, there is a kind of middle time or a now time where you are currently living, but there's an end point to it. There is some event that is going to end all life, all time, all existence. And what will end up happening at the end of that is that there is a final judgment uh, of all the faithful, or not even necessarily all the faithful, all the people who are there whether they accept the religion or not, uh, whatever their actions were in life, whether good or bad, that will come back to basically be held in judgment over them. And so Judaism offers this new way of looking at how humans interact with each other and interact with the world. Again, that idea of kind of free will, whether you want to go through and be just or unjust, that's going to come back one way or the other to reward or punish you. Now, if we fast forward past uh, the foundation of Judaism, uh, what ends up happening is that you will have 12 tribes uh, that are made up of the descendants of Abraham uh, and his son Isaac. Uh, and these 12 tribes inhabit the area that is the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. You have 10 tribes in the kingdom of Israel two tribes in the kingdom of Judah. They are separate kingdoms uh, for a while. According to Jewish tradition, there is a dire threat to these early Israelites, and that is going to be the Philistines. They are an outside group. 
uh, that are close to the coast of the Mediterranean, so kind of along the southwestern portion of modern-day Israel. And they are a very powerful and dangerous coalition. Individually, the two Israelite kingdoms cannot stand against uh, these Philistines on their own. And what ends up happening is the united monarchy, where both kingdoms unite under one ruler in order to pool their resources, and that is going to be under the rulership of David, and they defeat the Philistines. His son, Solomon, ends up building uh, what will be the first temple, uh, which is the crux, the major temple complex for Jewish worship in the world. Uh, it is going to be built in Jerusalem, which had been the capital of the, this united monarchy, this combined state, uh, and it is uh, basically set up as this is a place that Israelites would go in order to pray, in order to sacrifice. Uh, in many cases, this is where they would go to basically hear religious uh, sermons, also legal decisions. So Jerusalem becomes a cultural, religious, and political capital for the united monarchy. After Solomon dies, the kingdom, this united monarchy, splits again back into the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. And from here, this is where things uh, start to go really badly. The Neo-Assyrians, who are an empire to the northeast of uh, the region of Israel, are very strong. They are in Syria. They are in northern Iraq. And they are slowly pushing out and absorbing territory around them. What ends up happening is that the Neo-Assyrians, okay, to the northeast, and the Egyptian kingdom to the southwest, these are the two major powers in this region, 800s. What ends up happening is that these two nations, these two empires, are at war with each other. And unfortunately, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah are directly in the path of these two warring powers. So what will happen is these Israelite states are forced to basically switch allegiance back and forth between either the Assyrians or the Egyptians. In many cases, it's just allowing those two empires' armies to move through their territory to fight against the other one. Also paying tribute, also recognizing that either the Assyrian king or the Egyptian pharaoh is the dominant power, and that these Israelite kingdoms owe fealty to one or the other. Well the kingdom of Israel decides to reject Neo-Assyrian authority, and they decide to rebel against uh, them and break the alliance. The Neo-Assyrians go on a multi-year campaign of conquering the kingdom of Israel, and what they end up doing is, as they're winning battles against these Israelites, the Neo-Assyrians have this very horrific, though effective, way of breaking local resistance, which is population transfer, meaning that an area that they have recently conquered, they take out the majority of the population, and they resettle them on the other side of the Assyrian Empire. And then they replace the people they move with someone else who is also rebellious from the other areas of the empire. In effect, what they're doing is they're taking the locals out of their homelands, marching them hundreds of miles away, putting them into a new territory where they don't know the customs, they don't know the languages, they don't know the people that are around there, so they don't have a way of really raising any sort of resistance. So the ten tribes of Israel, who are identified as the ten lost tribes, they are taken out of the northern kingdom and sent through Syria and northern Iraq. And after they get into Iraq, they're lost to history. We're not sure. Historians do not know where they end up, and they become an enigma for centuries afterwards. Uh, what happened to these people? Do they still exist? Are there descendants of them somewhere further east in Asia? The people who end up replacing okay, these northern Israelites are people who have rebelled against the Assyrians in Mesopotamia. They are resettled in what had been this kingdom of Israel, uh, in many cases, they end up converting to Judaism, uh, and they abandon their original cultural identity. They abandon their original religion, 
the kingdom of Judah survives because it does not rebel against the Neo-Assyrians. Instead, it stays neutral and it affirms that the Neo-Assyrian king is the dominant power in their territory. Even though they have their own king, he is a vassal to this Neo-Assyrian state. And so they're allowed to survive the destruction of their northern kin. Fast forward another hundred years, and you run into the fact that the Neo-Assyrians have been destroyed by another power. In this case, it's the Neo-Babylonians. And they fill the vacuum. Once the Neo-Assyrians collapse, the Neo-Babylonians absorb the entire territory. And that puts the Neo-Babylonians right against the border of this kingdom of Judah. The kingdom of Judah, again, is an ally for a little while, the Neo-Babylonians. But then they decide to break that pact. And they end up going to war against the Babylonians. And the Babylonians have, again, a multi-year campaign to grind this kingdom of Judah down. And they are successful in conquering the kingdom of Judah. They end up sacking Jerusalem. They destroy the city. They destroy the Temple Mount. So they destroy that first temple that had been created by Solomon. And then what they end up doing is, just like the Neo-Assyrians, they do a population shift. They take the royal family of Judah, as well as the priestly classes and many of the upper classes, and they move them out of what had been the kingdom of Judah, and they move them around the city of Babylon. And this is the time of the diaspora, where the Jewish people, again, are displaced from their homeland, and they are being held captive in a different area. This does not destroy their religious or cultural identity. Instead, it reinforces it. What ends up happening is that you have the Tanaka, uh, the Hebrew Bible, being written while they're in exile in Babylon. And this is a way for them to protect their identity, to protect their culture, to make sure that they are not absorbed by the surrounding pagans and polytheists around them. You have another power in the ancient Near East that rises. This is going to be the Achaemenid Persian Empire coming out of what today is modern-day Iran. They quickly overwhelm and destroy the Neo-Babylonians, and the founder of the Achaemenid dynasty is Cyrus the Great. He is a combination of royal families. His mother is a Median princess. His father is a Persian prince. And what ends up happening is he has a very almost perfect family tree for him to go through and build this massive multi-state empire. Cyrus goes into Babylon and conquers it. And then he ends up freeing the Jewish prisoners who are there and allows them to go back to what had been the kingdom of Judah, allowing them to rebuild their temple allowing them to repopulate and rebuild Jerusalem and have basically maintaining the, the identity that had been stripped from them while they were in captivity. And Cyrus is a very interesting person. He is seen as a Messiah figure uh, for Israelites because he does not force a conversion. He does not force them to conform to what Persian culture uh, is going to be. Instead, Cyrus has this policy of allowing different cultural and religious groups inside his empire to exist. So long as they do not rebel, so long as they continue to swear fealty uh, to the Persian kings, then they're able to basically keep most of their administration, their, their local administration, their local customs, the religion, uh, and they are in effect not necessarily self-governing, but they're able to take care of their own community while the Persian Empire is the ultimate entity that makes it uh, a foreign policy. Uh, it makes policy in terms of economics and peace. And so when Cyrus the Great allows the Jews to go back to Judah, they go through the process of rebuilding their homeland, rebuilding their kingdom. What will end up happening is that uh, in the 300s BCE, you have Alexander the Great leading a coalition of Macedonians and Greeks, going on an invasion of the Persian Empire. And over the course of about 11 years, 
Alexander the Great marches from Europe through the ancient Near East, so the, the Middle East, North Africa, into Egypt, and then continues fighting his way into Central Asia all the way until he gets to the borders of India. And one of the territories that he ends up absorbing is this kingdom of Judah. Alexander was on a mission to conquer the Persian Empire, so he did not stay very long in the territories that he had conquered in the West. He continually moved eastward to engage the main Persian army and the Persian king Darius. Alexander had this idea of thing that he called Hellenism. It was a blending of cultures uh, between the West and the East. The idea that you keep the best ideologies the best philosophies, the best science, uh, the best people, uh, the best practices from each of these very different cultures and blend them together into a new culture. And the idea, or at least the ideal, the hope of what Hellenism was, was that you would make it so people were more closely aligned with each other's ideologies. There wouldn't be the desire for rebellion. There wouldn't be the desire to break away. Instead, you would bring the best of the West and the East together. Now, Alexander himself, while he does conquer the Persian Empire, he does not live long to enjoy the fruits of what he did. Instead, he ends up dying of illness in Babylon, in this massive kingdom that stretched from Greece and Macedonia to Egypt and then all the way to India, fragments from one political entity into multiple ones. These become... Hellenistic successor states, meaning that these are separate kingdoms carved out of that unified empire, and the people who are in charge of them are Alexander the Great's generals and then their children. And from about 323 BCE until 30, they are in the contest of which of these successor states is the dominant culture. And again, the territory of uh, the kingdom of Judah Israel is caught in the middle of some of these superpower states. To the southwest, you have Ptolemaic Egypt, which is a blending of Macedonian and Egyptian culture, where it is the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and so on of Alexander's general Ptolemy, who are in control of this territory. They want to control the region of Canaan, the region where the kingdom of Judah is at, because that has many rich trade routes through there. It is also one of the only avenues that other Hellenistic successor states can invade Egypt from. And the biggest enemy of the Ptolemies is the Seleucid state, which is the state set up by the general Seleucus, uh, and it is his sons and grandsons again who rule this kingdom. The Seleucid state consists of most of modern-day Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. And what will end up happening is the kingdom of Judah is the crossroads of conflict for these two Hellenistic powers. Anytime they are at war with each other, the only way that they can actually get to enemy territory is to cross into Canaan. And so over the course of this Hellenistic period, the successor states, the kingdom of Judah, again, flip-flops back and forth between either the Ptolemies or the Seleucids. And there is a blending of Israelite or Hebrew culture and Greek culture. And that is going to set up this conflict between different elements inside Israelite society. There are some who wish to bring in more Hellenistic culture, bring in more Hellenistic philosophy. And there are some who want to stay orthodox or want to stay as close to the original version. And so these two groups will vie with outside powers in order to find out which of them will be pretty much in control of the region internally. Now, while there are Hebrews, okay, there are Jews living in this territory, they're not the only people who live there. There are also Arabs who live there. Uh, there are Egyptians who live there. There are Greeks who live there. And so it's to a degree kind of a blended culture by this point in time with Hellenism. We fast forward, and as these Hellenistic states are in this constant period of war, almost 300 years where they're wearing each other out, fighting for control of these regions, there's another power in the West that is rising that will eventually 
eclipse and absorb them. And this is going to be the Roman Republic. This power is another one that is polytheistic. Uh, the Romans have the tendency that when they encounter other cultures, uh, when it comes to a foreign culture's god or goddesses, they're built in. They're accepted into the Roman pantheon. Uh, the idea is you may not worship these particular gods yourself, but you acknowledge that they exist. And if you need to, you could sacrifice to them, you could pray to them for intercession, but then you have your local gods that you do the same thing with. So the Romans for quite a while are very fluid in terms of adding and subtracting different deities over the course of time. Rome is a very dynamic and militaristic state. Over the course of 400 years, from about 450 BCE up to uh, the Common Era, the Romans are constantly expanding their borders. Uh, they start out just basically the territory around the city of Rome, and then eventually encompassing all of central Italy, uh, southern Italy and Sicily, northern Italy, uh, and then they break out of the Italian peninsula, they will go through a period of occupying parts of Spain until they absorb all of that. They will absorb the territory of modern-day France, which they call Gaul. They conquer North Africa, the western part of North Africa, which had been the Carthaginian Empire. Eventually, they will invade the kingdoms of Macedonia and Greece and take those over. And then that brings them into contact with the Hellenistic states of the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. And what will end up happening is, as the Seleucids are slowly destroyed by either the Romans or by a resurgent Iranian people known as the Parthians, the Seleucids disappear. Their territory is absorbed either by the Romans or the Parthians. Ptolemaic Egypt is semi-independent for a while, but eventually it will get absorbed too. And what ends up happening is that the kingdom of Judah finds itself in a position where once again, it is kind of in the crosshairs of a much larger power. For the Romans, control of the region, uh, they are hoping to have this area as a client kingdom. In this case, what the Romans label them, or label this area as Judea, what they're hoping is that the Judean kings will ally themselves with Rome and will be a trade partner, will be a military partner. Uh, maybe eventually the Romans would absorb the territory uh, into the Republic, into the Empire. But for the initial contact with it, the Romans, to a degree, keep a hands-off approach. They would rather have the area ruled internally and be friendly to Rome than have to have garrison this area constantly. It's expensive to have these armies sitting there. But some of the things that end up happening is that the ruling family inside the kingdom of Judea eventually caves more and more to Roman pressure to bring this kingdom of Judea closer and closer to Rome. And there is the fear among uh, Judeans that this means that this independent kingdom, uh, the covenant that exists between the Israelites and Yahweh, will be corrupted or destroyed by the Romans. And so you have a series of revolts that take place in which the Romans crush the Jews each time. The second uh, Jewish revolt is by far the most widespread and the most destructive. The Romans shift legions from different parts of the empire to go into the Middle East and attack different parts of Judea at the same time. When the war is at its peak, the Romans decide to make an example of the Jewish people. Once they have conquered Jerusalem and they've conquered the last of the, the strongholds that are spread throughout the territory, the second temple, okay, the temple that was built by the Judeans after they were allowed to come back to their home territory by the Persians, that is destroyed. It is leveled. The only thing that still remains of that second temple is what is the West Wall or the Wailing Wall. It is basically at the bottom of the Temple Mount and it is the stone foundation of the Jewish temple. That's the only thing that still exists from the second temple. The Romans go further. Uh, again, in order to try to break Jewish resistance, to ensure that there's not a third Jewish revolt, what ends up happening is that the Romans scatter the Jewish population. They can no longer be in the kingdom of Judea. That territory ceases to exist. 
the Jewish people are sent to all different corners of the Roman Empire. The territory is no longer referred to as Judea. Instead, it is referred to as Palestinia, where we get the term Palestine from. Jews are not allowed to travel on pilgrimage to Jerusalem in order for them to pray at the, at the West Wall or the Wailing Wall. They are separated, for the most part, from the rest of Roman society, and they are banned from government positions, they are banned from the military. Uh, they are, to a degree, their own separate social entity that exists within the empire. So what will end up happening is, again, once this dysphoria takes place, the dispersal of the Jewish people outside uh, of Judea, what will end up happening is the Romans allow Greeks, Romans, Egyptians, Arabs to move into the territory in order to repopulate it, and also to garrison it to make sure that there is not trouble in this region again. The Romans, to a degree, really would like to see uh, Judaism disappear. They, at this period when these Jewish revolts are happening, they're still polytheistic. The Romans have a very difficult time understanding the Israelites, the Judeans' mindset. Uh, how is it that one God controls everything for these people? How is it that it could protect them when the Romans basically devastate and displace uh, the population that's living in this region? You have Christianity starting roughly just before the Jewish revolts take place. And this is a offshoot of Judaism. You have uh, a new monotheistic religion that is trying to break away from Mosaic law and become more open. Initially with the Israelites, it is a very insular society. Uh, you do not see much in terms of intermarriage between uh, Jews and Gentiles. Uh, non-Jewish people. They are very insular. They, there's not a massive number of them. Uh, and with the followers of Christ, it's a small congregation to start out with, and it takes time to spread. And you have different factions vying for control of the message. Ultimately, you have Saul or Paul of Tarsus uh, becoming the de facto leader of the early Christians and his view of Christianity is that it should be more inclusive. If this movement is to survive, it cannot be the small fragment of Judaism. It has to be opened up to a wider group. And so many of the dietary laws and many of the cultural norms that make up Masonic law, they are dropped in order to allow the Christian community to grow. One of the parts of the covenant that shows that you are a worshipful Israelite is circumcision. Most of the cultures in uh, the Roman world and even the ancient Near East, they do not practice that. And so even if you're not necessarily restricted to dietary laws, if you're at the gymnasium or you're at the bath and people see that you are circumcised, that is a literal visual indicator that you are part of the Jewish religion whether you are follower of Masonic law or Judaism, or if you're one of these early Christians. Uh, circumcision is one of the things that is taken out in order to help split Christianity away from Judaism. The early followers of Christ, after his execution, they did not push heavily back against the Romans. Instead, most of them went underground. And the idea was to try to make sure that the Jesus movement survived. In order to do that, they distance themselves for, uh, from Judaism. And here is where we get uh, another instance of where religion and politics and culture uh, intersect into this region. Jerusalem is important to the Jews because it had been their capital city. It was also the site of their main temple, or I should say temples. And with the rise of Christianity, the Temple Mount takes on an incredibly significant relationship to Christianity. Uh, when Jesus was speaking to his disciples and he was speaking to the crowds, a lot of that, uh, while it takes place in the kind of the, the hinterlands uh, of Galilee, he does go to Jerusalem and he does speak at the Temple, on the Temple Mount. 
and he does perform actions there. And ultimately, this is one of the areas where he is going to be tried and found guilty, and then eventually he will be executed. The Temple Mount becomes instrumental for Christians in the story of Jesus. This is where the decision is made to martyr him by the Romans and the uh, Judeans. A little bit further away from the Temple Mount, you're going to have the Church of the Holy Sepulchre built, and that is going to be the supposed resting place for where Christ was buried before he uh, resurrected uh, and then went into hell in order to free the souls there and then descending up into heaven. So Jerusalem is claimed by Judaism and Christianity by the time we get to the first century CE and that becomes more and more entwined. By the time you get to the third and fourth centuries CE. Christianity is much more widespread than it had been. It is starting to become an officially recognized religion inside the Roman Empire. It is not the state religion at this point in time, but eventually it will be recognized as a protected religion. What will end up happening is that you have different major cities inside the Roman Empire that have such large followings of Christians in these areas that they become uh, termed sees or holy seats. You have Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch, Constantinople, and Rome as these five major Christian cities. They each have their own high patriarch, okay, their high priest on top of the regular priesthood, who will go through and to a degree make religious edicts. Uh, there's different versions of Christianity. There's Arian Christianity. There is uh, Monophysites. There are a number of different versions that eventually end up getting trimmed down into Orthodox Christianity. Uh, other versions are considered heretical. Again, you have this monotheistic Christian religion side by side with the monotheistic Judaic religion in the Middle East and throughout the Roman Empire. You have pagan religions still existing in these regions, and they're all mixed together. And since there is not a truly official version of a Roman religion, all of them can exist at the same time. Some of them are viewed as more legitimate than others. And once you hit the point of Constantine, then you start to see the pagan religions decline and eventually get outlawed, and Christianity is the religion of the empire. Uh, Judaism still exists, some of the pagan religions still exist, but they are declining in terms of followers. In the 4th and 5th century CE, the Roman Empire itself is going through a period of crisis. In order to keep this massive empire functioning, and to ensure that there were not massive numbers of civil wars taking place, Rome splits into two sections. You have a Western Empire, which is ruled out of Rome, and you have an Eastern Empire that is ruled out of Constantinople. In theory, both of these empires still constitute the entirety of the empire. The two emperors out of Rome and Constantinople are co-emperors, meaning that they both rule at the same time. If one of them needs help because an outside invasion or internal disruption is taking place, the other one's obligated to come and help them. By the time you get to the late 400s, the Western Roman Empire has collapsed. You have a series of barbarian migrations moving in, taking chunks away, and this is something that has happened over decades. Rome ends up falling, and you have barbarian successor kingdoms setting up territory in Italy and in France, Spain, North Africa. The Eastern Empire survives this. It does not collapse Instead, what ends up happening is they kind of contract their forces in order to protect their own borders. And the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, is going to be at war with the Parthians and later on by the Sassanid Persians. And these wars are going to devastate the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, you will have a series of massive plagues sweep through this area and decimate the population. On top of that, the Romans and the Persians conduct brutal campaigns against each other where they're wiping out cities 
in order to ensure that there's not a jumping off point for another invasion. And the region that is Palestinian at this point is also, once again, an area of contest between the Byzantines and the Sassanid Persians. In some cases during these wars, the Persians are able to actually punch through uh, Syria and move armies through Lebanon and into Palestinia. And at one point, they actually do take the city of Jerusalem. And one of the relics that the Sassanid Persians take is the Holy Cross, which is, the, which is supposed to be the cross that Jesus died upon. And they take this back, along with other treasures, to uh, their capital city of Tesaphon. And for, uh, from the 500s into the early 600s, there's a stalemate between the Byzantines and the Sassanids. They conduct still more series of wars, and eventually they wear themselves out to the point that you have, a, again, another series of plagues that break out that decimate the population on top of the other casualties of these wars. There's another power that is starting to rise on the periphery of the Byzantine and Sassanid empires. These are going to be the Arab tribes that are in the Arabian Peninsula. They had been allies to both the Byzantines and the Persians over the course of decades, but a new monotheistic religion has been spreading in this area since 610 CE, and that is going to be the monotheistic religion of Islam, uh, which is preached by the prophet Muhammad. He calls for the conversion of the Arab tribes, and then he looks at the areas, the warfare that is taking place throughout this region, and he believes that Islam is the last perfect version of Revelation, and that it is the his followers' mission to spread that beyond the Arabian Peninsula. Muhammad dies uh, after he takes Mecca and cleanses the Kaaba, which is the one of the holy sites in Mecca. Mecca is, is one of the most important cities for Muslims. Uh, it is the site of the Kaaba, which is where Muslims go annually on pilgrimage. Muslims are expected, if they can, to go on pilgrimage at least once in their lifetime and pray outside the Kaaba. The second most important city in Islam is the city of Medina, which is the city of the Prophet. This is where Muhammad and his followers were forced into exile uh, when they were forced out of Mecca. And it is the location of the first uh, Muslim mosque. When the Muslims break out of the Arabian Peninsula, they are able to get into Palestinia, into Lebanon, into Syria, Mesopotamia, Iran, Egypt, and they end up conquering a very large territory. By the time their expansion stops in the late 700s, uh, they have an empire that stretches from Spain and, and North Africa in the west all the way into India in the east. One of the things that the Muslims, the early Muslims do is once they end up taking Jerusalem, this becomes their third most holy city. Uh, according to Muslim tradition, uh, the Temple Mount is where Abraham was going to sacrifice his son Ishmael in order to prove his fealty to God. If you look at Judaic and Christian tradition, it is Abraham's, uh, Abraham is going to sacrifice his son Isaac. So there's, uh, again, they're both claiming that Abraham is their patriarch, but is a different son of Abraham that the Jews and Christians claim compared to who the Arabs claim as their patriarchs. So it's this area, this uh, Temple Mount, is important for all three monotheistic religions because it is where the covenant was going to be confirmed yet again by the sacrifice of a son. For Muslims, there's another part that ties to it. Uh, it according to their tradition, Muhammad has what is called the night journey where he is taken from Mecca to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and from there he's transported to heaven, where he speaks with all of the prophets who came before him uh, and basically affirm this, his final revelation. And from heaven he's transported back to Mecca, the site where Ishmael, or Isaac, was supposed to be sacrificed, is supposed to be the same rock that Muhammad was standing on when he was teleported to heaven. 
So now Islam and Muslims claim Jerusalem as a holy site as well. They claim the same Temple Mount as being paramount to their religion as well. So you see that you have the three monotheistic religions all claiming ownership of the city. In, in many cases, the local people who live there, they are not necessarily interested in annihilating what they would view as the wrong religion. They coexist. In many cases, while it might not be incredibly comfortable, they are not necessarily interested in destroying the territory. Instead, they figure out ways to work around who has access to the Temple Mount, who has access to the West Wall, who has access to the Holy Sepulchre. And one of the things that makes the area very contentious, uh, even to a greater extent, is that you have the Umayyad dynasty, who are a successor dynasty after the uh, what they would what is termed the Rashidun, okay, or the rightly guided caliphs, who had been followers of Muhammad, uh, direct followers of Muhammad. They had lived at the time that he was alive. They had spoken with him. They had lived with him. So they were viewed as being good successors because they protected the Ummah, they protected the community, they grew it. Uh, once they took over a region, they tried to ensure that there wouldn't be warfare in there again, if they could help it. The Umayyads come to power by killing Muhammad's nephew and son-in-law, who is Ali, and also they're responsible for the deaths of his sons, Hassan and Hussein, uh, effectively wiping out the bloodline of Muhammad. The Umayyads claim that they should be the next leaders uh, because they are most interested in ensuring that this community continues to grow, that it continues to go through the process of taking over new lands. One of the Umayyad caliphs ends up going through the process of renovating the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And what he ends up building are two complexes. Uh, one of them is the Dome of the Rock, which is a mosque that is built over the site of the rock where Ishmael or Isaac was supposed to be sacrificed, where Muhammad was transported to heaven. That is built in that spot, and over the course of the following centuries, it's going to be rebuilt and expanded. The Dome of the Rock has a golden dome over it, so it is one of the most easily identifiable buildings that is going to one of the few buildings that is actually going to be on the temple mount only muslims can go onto the temple mount uh, christians and jews are not allowed to actually climb it and and worship there's another mosque that is built uh, near the dome of the rock and that is the al-aqsa mosque this is where uh, male muslims would go to pray women and children end up going to the dome of the rock and the Jews are allowed to go to the West Wall, the Wailing Wall. That is, the, they cannot build a new temple on the Temple Mount uh, because they do not control the territory at the time. Uh, and there has been no third temple built uh, on the site since. Again, depending on who the, the Muslim leaders were at the time, uh, Christian and Jewish pilgrims uh, and settlers are allowed to come in to Jerusalem and set up and live in certain districts of the city. They can have their churches, they can have their synagogues, but they cannot go to the Temple Mount for the most part. That is an area that is, that is off limits to them. Once you have uh, the Umayyads fall and they're replaced by the Abbasids, there's a split inside the Muslim community. Uh, and there had been a split growing ever since Muhammad's death between two different sects, okay, two different groups. You have the Sunni Muslims who make up the majority of the community. And in their view, a caliph or a leader of the community does not have to have a direct blood link to the Prophet Muhammad. It could be anyone in the community who is willing to protect and expand. For the Shiites, the minority group, they believe that the leader of the community should be someone who has a line of descent from Muhammad. So while Ali was killed and Hussein and Hussein were killed, uh, Hussein had several sons that survived, and they become, to a degree, de facto heads of the Shiite community. Uh, whether they accept or take the position that is given to them of imam, 
is irrelevant. They are still viewed by Shiites as the legitimate uh, leaders of the Muslim community. And so you see a split between Sunnis and Shiites over leadership. These two factions eventually uh, will have different dynasties that they found that go to war over this region. Fast forward a couple hundred years to 1096 and 1099, you have the start of the Crusading period where Western European Christians go to war against the local inhabitants of the Holy, what they call the Holy Land, so the region of Palestine, also incorporating parts of Lebanon. The crusade is called to liberate Jerusalem from Muslim domination, and the first crusade is successful. Uh, these Western crusaders are able to carve out what they call the crusader kingdoms, and these are going to be basically uh, the territory around Jerusalem, into Lebanon, into parts of Syria. And these are set up as kind of what they would call Latin states, meaning that it is Western European Christians who are the ones that predominantly are in control of domestic and foreign policy. Uh, they're also to a degree in charge of the economy of the region. There's never enough of the Crusaders who decide to stay in the region for them to have a very large permanent community after the First Crusade. And so what ends up happening is for the generation after the First Crusade, the Christians, the Muslims, and the Jews living in that area, again, once again, figure out a way to coexist. You have the Muslim powers who are on the borders of these Crusader kingdoms that recover from the shock of this, and they decide that they're going to take the territory back. And you have these, most of these crusader kingdoms fall. The Muslims come back in and take the territory over. Crusade, the first crusade, when the crusaders take Jerusalem, is incredibly bloody by their own accounts. The crusaders talk about how they are going through certain streets inside Jerusalem, and there's blood up to their calves because they've killed so many of the inhabitants that are in the city. The Al-Aqsa Mosque, is turned into a headquarters and a stable for the Knights Templar, who are a religious order that is founded after the First Crusade in order to protect pilgrims and to protect holy sites in these Crusader kingdoms. In the process of doing that, when they got into the Dome of the Rock and they got into the Crusaders got into the Dome of the Rock and into the Al-Aqsa Mosque, they were massacring the people who had taken refuge there. Uh, they also had gone through and massacred a chunk of the Jewish population that was still inside Jerusalem. By the time you get to the, the counterattack that the Muslims will go through, which is successful, they do take Jerusalem and most of the surrounding territories, the Crusaders, when they launch their own counteroffensives, the Second Crusade, the Third Crusade, these fail. They're never able to take the territory back. And what ends up happening is what had remained of the surviving Crusader states is slowly ground down until there's none of them left. When you get into the 1300s, you have a new Muslim power that has shown up in Turkey. These are going to be the Ottoman Turks, and these are going to be initially led by a man named Osman I. This is where the term Ottoman comes from. They are Muslims. They had been sent into this particular part of Turkey as basically being shock troops and a buffer between the existing Muslim kingdom, the Seljuk Turks, and the rump or surviving aspects of the Byzantine Empire. And over the course of a few decades, the Ottomans are strong enough that they're able to declare themselves independent. And what ends up happening is the Ottomans go through the process of expanding both into Europe and into the Middle East, uh, further to their east and their south. They end up conquering the region that is Palestine. They end up conquering Iraq. They end up conquering down into the western part of the Arabian Peninsula so that they control uh, not only Jerusalem, but also Mecca and Medina. So the Ottomans hold the three major sites for the Muslim religion. The Ottoman sultans, the overall leader of this empire, declare themselves as protectors of the Sunni faith. So they see the Shiites as heretics. They're also in the process of conquering Christian territories in the Balkans, okay, in Southeast Europe. And 
The Ottomans, again, have a, a rather interesting way of administering their territories. As long as you fall into either Islam, Christianity, or Judaism, you are to a degree a semi-self-governing entity inside the Ottoman Empire. They all owe fealty to the Ottoman Sultan in Constantinople, which they have conquered by 1453. But they, these three religious groups are divided up into what are called millets. And basically what they are is that they are, again, that idea of religious communities or religious identities self-governing inside the empire. Uh, the Christians and the Jewish populations are going to be the ones who will go through and pay the majority of taxes inside the Ottoman Empire. Muslims in the Ottoman Empire are exempt from the taxes, but they are the ones who will serve in the military. You have a group that are called Janissaries that are Christian boys who are taken as slaves for the Ottoman Sultan, and then they're trained to either be the administrator, they're converted to Islam, they will be the administrators of the empire, or they will be soldiers for it, shock troops. From 1400 until 1918, the region that is Palestine is under Ottoman control. And for the most part, as long as the Christian, Jewish, and Muslim communities living in that territory will coexist and will not go into sectarian violence, the Ottomans basically allow the area to be what it is. Uh, they're not hostile to the idea that the Jews live in this particular territory. For Muslims, the people who are Christian, uh, Jewish, Muslim, they are what are called the peoples of the book. Again, they're all claiming descent from Abraham. They're all claiming the same prophets as being part of their religion. Uh, but as far as Muslims are concerned, the other two messages, Judaism and Christianity, are outdated and flawed. And ultimately, it is Islam that is the perfect last revelation. And so in their view, they see this as being the ultimate religion, the religion that should be uh, the dominant one. Well, the Ottoman Empire, for as long as it lasts, from 1300 to 1918, in the last hundred years that it exists, so from 1800 forwards, the Ottoman Empire is in horrific shape. While Europe is able to go through the process of modernizing and industrializing, the Ottoman Empire does not have the resources to do that. It does not have the colonies that places like France and England uh, will acquire in Africa and Asia and even in the Americas for a while. The Ottomans do not have that. And so as Europe is going through the process of their gunpowder revolution, and they're going through their industrial revolutions where you have steam power and you're having railroads laid down and factories being built, the Ottomans do not have that infrastructure or money in order to keep pace with Europe. And so over the course of the 17 and 1800s, the Ottomans fall further and further behind, and they start to lose wars against the Austrians and against the Russians in order to try to bring their armies up to a European standard, the Ottomans start to sell what are called concessions. It's the idea that they are surrendering some of the sovereignty of different territories inside their Middle Eastern Empire to either France or Great Britain in exchange for money or in exchange for technology or weapons or alliances especially against the Russians. And so what ends up happening is that the French really start to get an area of interest in the region that will be modern-day Lebanon. The British, where they start to gravitate towards, is going to be the region of Palestine, because one of the areas that they are conglomerating their hold on is going to be Egypt and South and East Africa. From the 1840s onwards, England is slowly going through the process of absorbing African kingdoms into the British Empire, and Egypt is going to be the territory that they want the most, uh, especially once Britain and France help finance the Suez Canal, uh, which is a man-made uh, channel that will connect the Mediterranean Sea 
and the Red Sea, meaning that this is an artificial waterway that cuts something like 8,000 miles worth of travel uh, off of either warships or off of merchant ships. So this control of the Suez Canal will give the British the ability to better control their empire in India and in the Far East, and will also open those areas up for more economic development. So Egypt becomes part of the British Empire, and Palestine is still part of the Ottoman Empire. But the British are starting to view Palestine as being essential to the protection of their Egyptian holdings. You have a lot of other things that are going on inside Europe as well. Uh, during the late 1700s and early 1800s, you have what is the emancipation of the Jews inside Europe, especially Western and Central Europe. Uh, up to this time, if there are Jewish populations in major cities or larger towns, they are separated from the rest of the society. The Jews are basically put into what would be termed ghettos or regions where they are collected, usually outside the city walls, uh, and they will be their own kind of semi-separate community. With Christianity, you cannot charge, uh, if you're a Christian lending money to another Christian, you cannot charge interest or usury. So if you have a king or you have a city-state that needs to raise money, and they have to do it fast, the only people who have the ability to raise those funds and be able to give them to these political entities are the Jewish populations living inside those territories. If a particular ruler does not want to pay that loan back, what they can do is basically allow the Gentile population to go in and perform a pogrom or attack on the Jewish community that's there and to a degree wipe out the debt so they never have to repay it. The emancipation of the Jews, that ends that policy in Western and Central Europe. Uh, the Jewish communities are no longer separated. Instead, they're allowed to intermarry and they're allowed to integrate uh, and convert. If they do not, if these people do not have a desire to be identified as Orthodox Jewish, they assimilate into the, the society that they're in. So they wear, you know, Western European clothes. They do not go to synagogue. They could convert. They can marry someone outside the religion. And potentially their children could either be Christian or they could be Jewish. Um, you would have secular Jews who are still practicing, you know, to a degree, they still practice the religion, but they do not, that is not their key identity. But in Eastern Europe and in Russia, you still have these major pogroms, these major attacks on the Jewish community taking place. And these are going to happen in the 1870s and 1880s uh, and into the 1890s. And what will end up happening is that Tsarist Russia, in order to kind of go through the process of legitimizing some of the uh, inefficiency and corruption inside their government. The Tsarist secret police will go through the process of writing this propaganda piece that is still around today and is called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. This is a fake propaganda piece. It is one of the cornerstones of many conspiracy theories from the 19th century all the way to the 21st century. Basically what this Protocols of the Elders of Zion is, is a conspiracy saying that the Jewish populations who are scattered throughout all these different countries in the world are a cabal that control the media and the economy and they are the shadow behind uh, the governments and they are pitting these non-Jewish entities against each other in a hope that eventually they'll be able to take over the world. This is something that the Russian secret police put out in order to justify some of the attacks that are taking place uh, in major Russian cities like Odessa. They're trying to justify why these purges and these expulsions of Russian Jews are taking place. And this Protocols of the Elders of Zion is translated from Russian to German to French to Italian to English to Spanish, pretty much any major language in Europe. And it becomes a cornerstone of anti-Semitism in the late 19th century and 20th century. 
you have uh, a situation inside Western Europe, too, where there are new states that have emerged in the 1860s and 1870s. The Prussians in 1871 unify the German states and make the German Empire. And the country that they defeat in order to do that is the French Republic. The French desire for revenge uh, and to gain back the territories of Alsace-Lorraine, which the Germans strip and make part of their empire, really pushes uh, French internal, domestic, and foreign policy of how they interact with everyone around them. You have this trial that kicks up in Paris, France, that is called uh, the Dreyfus Affair. Alfred Dreyfus was a French artillery officer who, is also, who was also Jewish, who is accused of being a spy for the Germans. Uh, he had had a very high rise in terms of his career very early on. Uh, he made a lot of people who had been in the French army jealous of how quickly he had, rise to the, he had raised through the ranks and the fact that he was uh, a French Jew. And so what he is accused of is selling French military secrets to the Germans. And this is done mostly through hearsay. Supposedly, there in Dreyfus's office, there is a letter that's discovered that is from the German ambassador, uh, basically laying out how much they're willing to pay in order for him to for Dreyfus to give the Germans the layout of French defenses along the borders. Many people inside France, a lot of the French uh, intelligentsia, uh, the authors, newspaper reporters, uh, kind of opposite opposition leaders inside the French government, when they see that this trial is going to take place, they look at it as this is not an attack on Dreyfus that he's a spy. They're looking at it as this is an anti-Semitic attack. The, the fact that he is being shown as a traitor because of his religion instead of the evidence that is not being produced by the French military and the French government. He can be executed if he's found guilty of treason. The first trial goes through, and many people in the media and also people who are uh, defenders for Dreyfus in the court say that this is an unfair trial, that he is being set up as a scapegoat, and that the attacks are, again, against his religion much more than against the evidence that has been presented against him. He is found guilty in this first trial. He is not executed. But what ends up happening is he is given what's called the dry guillotine, which is where he is exiled from France, and he is sent to a prison colony off the coast of French South America. And basically what they're hoping is that he dies of either disease or starvation or something else. The critics of this trial go through the process of writing magazine and newspaper articles in order to denounce the decision. And one of them is Emile Zola, who is, at that time, France's greatest writer. And Zola has a massive following because he, goes, he writes about subjects that are to a degree taboo at the time for the government. He talks about the defeat of France by Prussia. He talks about the problems uh, and the dangers that French industrial workers and miners are going through because there's no safety for them. There's no legal protection for them. So Zola is, he's a dear to the working class. He's a dear to opposition to what is this French uh, Republic government. And he writes this newspaper article that is circulated throughout not only France, but the rest of Europe, and it's called J'accuse, I accuse. And he makes the point that this French Republic government put together this anti-Semitic trial to basically find Dreyfus guilty, no matter what the evidence was. And the outcry that comes because of this is going to have massively wide ramifications. Dreyfus gets a second trial. He's brought back to France and tried again. He is acquitted of treason, but he is not allowed to rejoin the French military. 
his pension for being in the military for as long as he has is taken away from him, and he really becomes a pariah in French society. He ends up dying, and it's not until the late 20th century that the French government actually goes through the process of apologizing for what happened to him and his family. The fact that he was wrongfully accused, that he was stripped of his rank, that he was stripped of his pension, that he was pretty much thrown out of everything that had been his life. While the trials are going on, there are reporters from all across Europe and the Americas going to Paris to hear the arguments. One of them is a man named Theodore Herzl, and he is going to be one of the founders of Zionism. He is from Austria, he's from the city of Vienna, and he's horrified by these trials because he's looking at it as, okay, supposedly there was the emancipation of the Jews in the early 1800s, and yet the vehement hatred is still there in these countries that are supposed to be, especially France, about equality, liberty, and brotherhood. Austria, that empire, also is very anti-Semitic. And what Herzl ends up doing is he's writing about the trial, but he's also writing about the state of the Jewish people throughout Europe. The fact that they're being attacked in Russia, and now they're being attacked in France. What is to say that it's not going to happen in Germany or in Austria? And so he comes up with this philosophy, the idea that there needs to be a Jewish homeland where they are, in a sense, protected from the outsiders, the outside world. And he creates uh, this organization from not only the Austrian Jewish community, but from Russia and Germany and France and Italy and Switzerland, England and America. It becomes what is known as the World Zionist Organization. And what this is is a group of leaders that will go to the different major governments in the world and see if they will be supportive of creating a Jewish homeland somewhere. Ultimately, the area that the Zionists would like to see this Jewish homeland come back up into is Palestine. They view that as the legitimate homeland of the Jewish people, and that's where this Jewish state should exist again. There are many problems with this. One of them being Palestine is not under the control of any European power. It is under the control of the Ottoman Empire. And while the Ottomans will allow a certain number of European Jews to immigrate into the area, they do not want to see hundreds of thousands abandon Europe and come into Palestine. That is an area that, it, for even the Ottomans, is very contentious. Uh, the Ottomans had have had their own territory shrinking because of the actions of the Russians. The Ottomans end up losing the Crimean Peninsula. They end up losing most of the territory in the Northern Caucasus to the Russians. The Muslim populations in those areas are expelled, and the Ottoman Empire has to absorb those people. What happens with those refugees, a lot of them either settle in Syria, Lebanon, or Palestine. So the local populations in these regions are already strained by another group of refugees. For the most part, since they are Muslim, they are more readily accepted into these areas. But the idea of bringing in more Christians or particularly more Jewish immigrants is not something the Ottomans want to see. The World Zionist Organization asks London and Paris if they would be willing to try to apply some sort of pressure to the Ottoman Empire to see if they would be interested in opening up okay, more opportunities. And it is not successful. Uh, the British offer the potential of different areas for Jewish colonization in East Africa, but there's really no precedent for why a Jewish homeland would be in those regions. And the World Zionist Organization says, no, thank you, we'll, we'll wait, we'll see what happens. Uh, as time goes on, we, we do want Palestine as this new uh, state of Israel. You have World War I breakout, which is initially a European conflict, which spreads into a very quickly into a world conflict. You have Great Britain, France, and Russia 
as the Entente powers, or later on the Allied powers. You have the Central Powers made up by Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire, forming roughly around October 1914. And so you have Europe, Africa, the Middle East. You have the Far East also being consumed in this war. One of the areas that is uh, in the target of uh, Britain's strategic view is Palestine. There's already a British army sitting in Egypt. There is a British army sitting in Iran. And what the British will try to do is invade the Ottoman Empire from the south. One army coming in through Mesopotamia, so going up the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. The other army crossing the Egyptian border and trying to go into Palestine. Neither of these British offensives go well. Uh, the army that is fighting in Mesopotamia is encircled and destroyed. And that sets the British war plans back years in that region. The Ottomans and Germans actually launch an offensive before the English are ready. And even though they cannot penetrate into Egypt itself, there's no really developed railroads. There's no major fuel lines set up. There's no real large sources of fresh water set up to supply large armies moving in the Sinai Peninsula or in Palestine itself. And so from 1914 to about 1916, that's a static war front where there's really not too much going on with it. But each side is building up their forces, either in Palestine or the Sinai, getting ready to fight again. Here's where things get more complicated, sorry to say. The Arab tribes that are in the Arabian Peninsula, while ostensibly they are vassals to the Ottoman Empire, many of them since the 1860s, have been trying to figure out a way to break away from the Ottomans and set up their own individual states where they're self-governing. You have two major tribal groups uh, that the British will approach. In the Hejaz, where you have Mecca and Medina, so on the western side of the Arabian Peninsula, you have the Hashemites, who are, again, ostensibly Ottoman subjects, but they have their own ambitions. They want to break away from the Ottoman Empire. The British will approach them, asking the Hashemites if they would be willing, uh, with British money and British weapons, to rise up and revolt against the Ottomans. There are different uh, understandings of what this alliance is going to be and what will be the end result. These are called the Hussein McMahon correspondence. What ends up happening is that McMahon is the British diplomatic leader who is in Egypt, who is basically making these offers to Hussein, who is the king of the Hejaz, who's leader of the Hashemite clan, who is actually, uh, the Hashemites are the clan that Muhammad was from. So in theory, these are people who have sort of a direct line to the prophet. So they could be viewed as uh, leaders of the Muslim community. If the king of Hejaz revolts against the Ottomans, there is a very real possibility that other Muslims inside the Ottoman Empire will rebel against them too. What Hussein wants is he wants to make Hashemite states when the war is over. He wants to make kingdoms for his sons that will be self-ruling. They will be autonomous. They will not be a puppet to Britain or France. Uh, they will be their own entities. McMahon makes the agreement that this will happen. But there is already backdealing taking place. The British are in communication with the French and Russian governments, their major allies, discussing how the Ottoman Empire will be split between the three powers after the war is successfully won by the Entente. Britain, France, and the, Soviet, and the Russians will basically have spheres of influence and divide the Ottoman Empire into different territories they control. The British do not tell the Hashemites that these negotiations exist. This is what is called the Sykes-Picot Agreement. This is something that is agreed to between the Entente powers at the same time that McMahon is making the deal with Hussein in order to get them to rebel against the Ottomans. So already there's some duplicity taking place. The other Arab tribe that the British discuss uh, a potential rebellion with is the House of Saud. 
And this is going to be the founding house of what will be modern day Saudi Arabia. They are around the oasis of Riyadh, and they are enemies of the Hashemites. Both of these two groups, these two major Arab tribal powers, feel that they should be the legitimate leaders of the Arab uh, Muslim communities. And so what will happen is, well, the Hashemites actually raise their forces and fight side by side with the British in Palestine and in Lebanon and in Syria. The House of Saud hoards the money and weapons that the British give them and do not fight against the Ottomans. Instead, what they end up doing is they save those weapons and conserve them. And then in 1920, after World War I is over, the House of Saud will push the Hashemites out of the Arabian Peninsula completely, and they found the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Now, one of the reasons that this is so important to what is happening today is this split of what the Arab Muslims expected the British to honor in comparison to what happened casts a massive shadow over Arab and Western European relations from 1918 all the way to the present day. Uh, it's the idea that they had the, the Hashemites, the Arabs, had been lied to in their view. They had been told that if they help overthrow the Ottomans, they would be completely free of outside interference, when in reality the British and French had already decided what territories of the Ottoman empires where the Hashemites were going to be at after the war was going to fall to them. Now, the British, they claim the territories of Palestine and Jordan, and they'll eventually also get Iraq, too. For France, they claim the regions of Lebanon and Syria. And so there's this split between Britain and France that they've already agreed on before the war is even over. They do not let the Hashemites know this is taking place until it is already done and until the peace treaty to end the war is being signed. For the Hashemites, they want Palestine to be one of the kingdoms that they set up because that would mean that the Hashemites would be in control of Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. They would be the dominant tribal group that were the protectors of all the major religious sites for the Muslim faith. 1916, you have the Arab Revolt, and this is where you get Lawrence of Arabia, a British intelligence officer, who actually goes and fights alongside the Hashemites. Uh, he becomes friends with Hussein uh, and his sons Abdullah and Faisal, and when he finds out about the sykes pico agreement, he cannot tell them what is going on, but it disgusts him with what he feels, too, as a betrayal of the agreement that was made. Uh, when it comes time for the division of the Ottoman Empire to be decided uh, in Paris and in other places, Lawrence actually goes as part of the Hashemite delegation instead of the British delegation. And he, to his dying day, feels a sense of betrayal. Not that he betrayed England, but that he betrayed Faisal and Abdullah, Hussein, and the Hashemite Arabs who had fought next to him for two years. Now, ultimately, what will happen is, is that the British army that is in Egypt in 1917 pushes out of the Sinai Peninsula and starts invading southern Palestine. You have the Hashemite Arabs pushing out of the Arabian Peninsula and raiding into the eastern part of uh, what would be Palestine and Jordan into southern Syria. By the time you get to December 1918, the British army has occupied or liberated Jerusalem. And they have the British army uh, go through the city first, and then they allow the Hashemite troops to come in a parade afterwards. And then the British and the Hashemites continue pushing further into northern Palestine, and they're pushing into southern Lebanon, and pushing into southwestern and central Syria. By the time that the war ends, most of the Ottoman territories in Iraq, in Syria, all of Lebanon, all of Palestine, they have already fallen to the British. When the ceasefire is signed, 
in the middle of October 1918, which takes the Ottoman Empire out of the war. The British evacuate the territory that's supposed to go to France, and the British garrison the area that is their sphere of influence. French forces come in, they occupy Syria and Lebanon, and this is where the Hashemites first realize that they have been betrayed. Because Syria and Lebanon were supposed to go to Faisal, the territory of Palestine and what will be Jordan is going to go to Abdullah. The only Hashemite who actually gets his territory is Abdullah. He'll have the area that is called Transjordan. Faisal, after World War I is over, and after the British and French agree to where the division of territory is going to be at, and it gets ratified by the League of Nations, Faisal tries to raise the Syrian rebels, the Syrian Arabs that were his followers, against the French. He goes on a one-year military campaign against them, and the French crush him. Faisal had expected the British to come into this uh, war against the French on his side, and the British stay neutral. And what they, because they do not want to upset the French, uh, the Treaty of Versailles has not been completely uh, finalized and enforced yet, and they are afraid that if they make the French mad, then perhaps they won't be uh, as stringent as guarding the border with Germany. What ends up happening is, is that uh, the British offer to give Faisal the territory of Mesopotamia, or the Kingdom of Iraq, a territory that he had really no experience with and had no claim to take over. He agrees to do that. Uh, eventually, he will die in a car accident, and his son will end up dying very young, and his grandson is uh, left until he is overthrown in the 50s in a military coup where he is executed. Abdul's rule on Transjordan, though, for the most part, is relatively stable. He decides to take the territory that he is given by the British and work with what he has. He does carve out some concessions, though, because one of the other things that, has, that was promised uh, between 1916 and 1918 is this piece of paper, this legislature, that's called the Belford Declaration. Arthur Belford had been a British prime minister uh, who had retired, but he still had ties to the British cabinet, the British government. He was in contact with one of the Rothschilds, uh, a major financier uh, in the world who also was Jewish, who was a Zionist, and Belford and Rothschild were exchanging correspondence, and one of them was a response that Belford gave to Rothschild saying that the British government would be willing to help set up a Jewish homeland in Palestine. The problem with this declaration is that Belford has no authority to issue something like this. He is not the British Prime Minister when he makes his promise. He is not an active member of Parliament. He is just a private citizen with a lot of connections who makes this statement who sends this telegram and what ends up happening is the telegram is intercepted as it's going to Rothschild and it's leaked to the press. When the Arabs in the region, whether they're Muslim or Christian, find out that this has happened on top of the fact that the Hashemite kingdoms have been truncated and made into kind of vassal territories, this is more fuel in the fire of why the Arabs do not trust the British and the French. When the United Nations is coming up with the what the world is going to look like at the end of the First World War, when the Ottoman Empire is being dismantled, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire is being dismantled, and the German Empire is being dismantled, and the Russian Empire is being dismantled, in many cases, the people who are living in the local regions are not part of those negotiations. So they have no say in how their territory is going to be divided up. Hussein and Abdullah are able to get one concession from the British. Uh, once the British are named the mandate power, the power that is going to oversee the region of uh, Palestine, Transjordan, and Iraq, there can be Jewish immigration only on the west side of the Jordan River. So the territory that makes up modern-day Israel, Palestine, is the only spot where Jews from Europe or the Americas can emigrate into 
everything east of the Jordan River that is strictly an Arab territory. Uh, and again, whether those Arabs are Muslim or Christian, there's still Jewish communities scattered throughout different areas in the Middle East. Uh, but for the most part, there's not going to be a major population increase uh, by immigration in those areas. So a mandate is basically, it is the concept that these territories, uh, like Palestine and Transjordan and Iraq, for the British, Lebanon and Syria for the French, these eventually will be set up to become independent states at some point in the future. But there is no given date for when this is going to happen. There's no real way for the local population that is living in there to be able to push for a the ability to have their own foreign policy uh, in some cases, a domestic or economic policy, is whoever the mandate power is. They're the ones who are going to help develop this country, and they put to a degree the people they want in charge of these territories. Well, you have a lot of feelings of betrayal on many sides once the British take this territory over. The local Arabs feel that they have been betrayed. The Zionists, who are from either Palestine or or from Europe, to a degree also feel betrayed because this declaration of a Jewish homeland is not immediate and it is not put together in a way that actually defines what this state is supposed to be. Okay, Is this going to be a state where Jews and Muslims and Christians all live together, all with equal rights, all with equal parts in the economy and in the political system? Uh, the legal system, or is this Jewish state going to be something that is more along the lines of religious orientation, where you will have a separate Jewish state, you will have a separate uh, Muslim and Christian Arab state. How are you going to divide the territory? There's no clean break where you don't have these different communities intertwined with each other. You don't have just particular cities where they are all Zionists, they're, they're all Jews, or they're all Muslims, or they're all Christians. Everything is intertwined. When it comes to the infrastructure as well, there's not much in the way of railways. There's not much in terms of manufacturing. There's not much in terms of power plant infrastructure. Uh, most of that has to be built from the ground up. And what starts to happen is that because the Arabs are resistant to the British being there, they go through this process of their political leaders, uh, the Palestinian political leaders. They are trying to pressure the British to guarantee that there will be only a certain number of Jewish immigrants who come into the territory and that they will not arbitrarily split the territory into a position where neither state can survive if it's going to be a two-state territory. Uh, there's argument over who gets precedence in Jerusalem. Are Jews going to be allowed to go to the Temple Mount in order to pray at the Wailing Wall? Will they be able to go to the top of the Temple Mount uh, and, and worship up there? Are Christians going to be able to do that? There's a lot of different religious and ethnic and cultural issues that are going on. And quite frankly, the British mandate government never had a plan of how to deal with this effectively. You hit a point in the early 1920s where things are going to boil over. Uh, as you have infrastructure being put in and this mandate domestic government being created, you have the British in overall control of the territory and they're bringing in, uh, in theory, they're supposed to bring in the Zionists as part of the government of this new territory and the Arabs in there. But what will end up happening is that there is an imbalance of power. The local Palestinian Arabs feel that they are not being involved in the economy and the political and legal system as much as they should be. They feel like they're second-class citizens. And what ends up happening is there is a massive bowlover uh, in violence. Okay, In 1929, you have what is uh, called the Wailing Wall Incident or the Palestine Massacres. And what has happened is that there is growing tension 
between the Zionist settlers, the local Palestinian Arabs, and the British mandate government that is trying to control this area. The Zionists and the Arabs are both dissatisfied with the British mandate government. Both of them feel that they're not getting the recognition and the rights that they are supposed to be under this. And what ends up happening is that there is a riot that takes place in Jerusalem near the West Wall, near the Wailing Wall. You have a Zionist youth organization called the Batar, which marches on the wall, okay? And they are chanting, the wall is ours. Uh, what you have in this situation is that around the Temple Mount, you have uh, bazaars, trade bazaars, marketplaces that are set up that are usually Muslim. And if when the Jews go there in order to pray at the West Wall, they have to pass through those bazaars. They go there, they do their rituals, and they leave. Well, when this, uh, this Batar organization shows up and they're chanting the walls is ours, there is a fight that breaks out between the Muslims who are in this bazaar and the Zionist youth organization. And it is broken up. But what ends up happening between August 23rd and August 29th, 1929, are a series of massive anti-Jewish riots that break out in Jerusalem and Hebron and Safed. And ultimately, there are 133 Jews who are killed, with another 339 who are injured. Many Jewish homes and businesses are looted or burned or destroyed. At the same time, as the British uh, police, the local Palestinian uh, police, which is made up of both Arabs and Jews, go out to break up these riots. They start firing into the crowds in order to stop the violence going on. The Jews who are living in this area also try to defend themselves. There are 110 Arabs killed and 232 that are injured. And it takes several days for the British police and military to put these riots down. And what ends up happening is that the Zionist organizations basically tell the British government that you failed to protect the Jewish communities that are here and that you need to take steps in order to disarm the Palestinian Arabs that are there. There needs to be a way that the Zionist settlers that are in the territories can defend themselves. There has to be a militia. This is going to be the foundation of the Haganah, which is basically it, Zionist paramilitary militias that will be trained and armed by the British army in order to repel Arab uh, invaders. This Westfall incident is just the beginning of what is going to be trouble from 1929 all the way to 1947. This is the first rumbling of a storm that is going to consume this area. The British government goes through a process of trying to figure out, okay, we made the promise that there's going to be this Zionist, this Jewish homeland in this territory. We also have an obligation to the Arab population that's there. We need to actually come up with a commission to figure out what are we going to actually do with this territory. Are we going to make this a single state, or are we going to break this into a Jewish state and an Arab state? And where is the division going to come from? Is it going to be based on population? If that is the case, how much territory does each side get? How do you make these two states have enough infrastructure and agricultural lands and fresh water so that they'll be able to actually function? And this first commission does not really come up with a good plan what to do. They say, okay, we should partition the country, but we still need to do some more studies before we decide on what is happening. Again, that does not please the Zionists, and that does not please the Arabs who are there. And this is going to lead to an even larger outbreak of violence. Between 1936 and 1939, you have what is called the Arab Revolt, or the Great Arab Revolt. This is taking place inside Palestine, and it is a territory-wide rebellion. You have Haj Amin al-Husseini, who is the Mufti of Jerusalem, 
one of the highest uh, imams or religious leaders inside Jerusalem who tells the Muslim community that they need to rise up, overthrow this British mandate government, and push the British and the Zionists out of the territory, completely expel them. And this is going to be a three-year-long guerrilla insurgency where the British army is going to have to send more and more equipment and soldiers into the region in order to crush this Arab uprising. Uh, there are going to be massacres that are conducted by both the Arabs and the Zionists against the opposing okay, groups where they go into different villages and destroy one or the other in retaliation for something that uh, an attack that may have happened on a village somewhere else in the country. So these two communities are destroying each other. And what ends up happening is that the British see that the Zionists in their eyes are the more reasonable party. And what will happen is the British and the Haganah, this uh, Jewish self-defense force, in many cases work hand in hand in crushing the Arab militias that are fighting against them. The Palestinian Arab leadership, whether they are the religious side of it or, more importantly, the secular side, so people who had been trying to be part of this mandate government, they are either imprisoned or they're forced into exile. Or if they're not forced into exile, they are so discredited by the fact that they cannot push the British out that they are pushed out of office. Now, Hajimin al Husseini himself he actually flees Palestine early on in the Arab revolt, and he ends up becoming a guest in Nazi Germany. Now, in the 1930s, on top of the disruption that is taking place in the Middle East, you also have the rise to power of the Nazi party in Germany. The Nazis are anti-Semitic. Adolf Hitler, their leader, has made it very clear that he does not want Jews to be inside Germany or inside Austria, and for the most part, inside any place in Europe. And once Hitler comes to power and the Nazis uh, are the only political party inside Germany, there are anti-Semitic laws that are going to be passed. You have a group that are called the Nuremberg Laws, which basically strip German and Austrian Jews of their citizenship, of their economic positions. They cannot be university professors. They cannot be teachers. They cannot be lawyers. They can't be doctors. Uh, they cannot be in the government. They cannot be in the military. They are being edged out of all German economic and social life. If you have uh, a marriage between uh, a Jew or, and a Gentile, that marriage is no longer legal, is no longer valid. So people who have converted from Judaism to Christianity, they're still considered in Nazi eyes and legal ease as Jewish. And so they have to divorce okay, their uh, gentle partner. The children that they had produced are considered bastards for the most part, so they are viewed as also uh, not being part of German society. They will not be able to inherit their parents' property or grandparents' property. There is a policy of what is called Aryanization inside Germany, where Jewish businesses are sold for pennies on the dollar to Aryan or German business people. And if German and Austrian Jews want to leave the Third Reich, they want to leave Nazi Germany, they're limited to how much money they could take with them, what sort of property they could take with them. And if they leave the country, anything they leave behind is basically, if it's not sold to an Aryan, it's considered property of the German government. So with this, these anti-Semitic laws coming through and more and more persecution hitting uh, German Jews, there is a need to get out of the country. There are people who want to emigrate. Some people don't, some people do. But they're faced with the prospect that countries like Britain and the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, France, they only allow a certain number of Jewish refugees 
to come into their territory every year. For the United States, it's 10,000. In Germany, you're looking at less than 1% of the German population by the time the Nazis take power in 1933. Less than 1% of that population identify as Jewish or are identified as Jewish. But that's still more than any single European or American country is going to be able or willing to accept at a time. So there are a lot of these European Jews who want to flee to Palestine. But the British, because they're having this great Arab revolt and they're trying to figure out a way to either crush it militarily or come to some sort of political terms in order to end it, they are not willing to upset the balance in the Middle East. It's not just the Muslims in Palestine that the British are worried about angering. There had been revolts in Iraq, which the British controlled. There were There is the Egyptian Brotherhood, which is a political religious organization that comes up in Egypt in 1928, which seeks to expel the British from Egypt. Uh, and it has branches that form in Palestine and in Iraq and in other areas that Western powers control. There are millions of Muslims in the Indian territories that have been clamoring to break away from the British Empire and to break away from Hindu Indians. And so the British are trying to play this, they're standing on this kind of razor's edge of what their policy is going to be, and they have no idea what it's going to be. There's another commission that is called in London in order to figure out why this Arab revolt took place. And they start arguing that maybe maybe partitioning this territory is not the right way to do it. Maybe we try to get these two groups to actually work together once the area is quieted down. And then you have the outbreak of World War II. Nazi Germany invades Poland. Britain and France declare war against Germany. And any Jews that are trapped in Eastern Europe especially in Germany and what had been formerly Austria, and Poland for that matter, are no longer able to escape. They are under German domination again. Once the Germans turn on okay, Western Europe and they conquer the Netherlands and Belgium and Luxembourg and France, all of the people who had fled Germany in the mid to late 1930s, all the, the German and Austrian Jews who had tried to escape but could not get visas to leave the Netherlands and Belgium and France and Luxembourg, they're back in Nazi hands. And you will have the Nazis go through the process of the destruction of European Jews, the Holocaust, where they go on an industrial scale of murder. They murder a minimum of 6 million European Jews, and it may be even higher than that. And the ultimate goal is to wipe the Jewish people out completely in Europe. And then if the Germans are, the Nazis are able to win in Europe and in the Soviet Union, then they would continue that war and they continue that policy of genocide until they wiped out every Jewish community in the world. The Germans started to reach out to Arab communities in Iraq and in Syria, in Lebanon, and in Palestine to see if those groups would be interested in revolting against the British or the French. And some of them say yes. Uh, the Iraqi government is briefly overthrown in a pro-Nazi coup. And what ends up happening is the British have to send military forces into Iraq, reinstall Faisal's grandson, Faisal II, as the Iraqi king, even though he's only like nine at the time. And they have to occupy Iraq for the rest of the war. The British also send more forces into Palestine and Jordan to reinforce that area. They will invade uh, French Syria and the Lebanon in 1940 between 1941 and 1943 and take those areas over. Syrian and Lebanese Arabs will fight against the British occupation, and there are still some Palestinian Arabs who will fight against the British through the Second World War. The Jewish community that is in Palestine offer to raise regiments of their own in order to help the British fight against Nazi Germany. And while there are some that are formed, they're not sent into combat directly. 
uh, again, the British are trying to ease tensions inside Iraq and in Egypt and hopefully try to draw India out of its neutrality in the Second World War to fight on the side of the Allies. And so the British play, again, this very careful game of trying to appease everyone and not appease anyone at all. Between 1941 and 1945, the Holocaust is taking place in Eastern Europe and throughout Western Europe. Once Nazi Germany surrenders in May 1945, even before their official surrender, many of the concentration and death camps that the Nazis have set up to wipe out the European Jews had been liberated. And what the Germans did was if there were sick prisoners, they left them behind, hoping that they would die of starvation or whatever illness they had. Those prisoners who were healthy enough to march to either railroads or trucks or just on foot were moved further and further into the interior of Germany itself. The first death camps that are liberated by the Allies are scenes of unimaginable horror. You have thousands of bodies of people who have been starved to death or have died to disease laying just in the barracks, on the ground, in open mass graves. You have people who are living skeletons where they have no body fat. They have almost no, bu no muscle to them. They've been starved to that point. And what will happen is the generals in the Allied armies go to these camps to see what's going on in them. They end up sending crews that are attached to the Allied armies, media crews, to photograph and film what has happened and what has been found in these camps. And they're going to use this as the evidence for crimes against humanity. Uh, once the Germans surrender, there's still roughly, you have 6 million European Jews who have been murdered. There's still about another million and a half who are alive. Many of them had been either in hiding, the vast majority had been in these camps, and had been liberated there. When the war is over, there's the question of what do we do now? No one had ever really believed that the Nazis would do what they had done. The idea that they would annihilate an entire group of people based on their religion and follow through. There was renewed cry that there needs to be a Jewish homeland after this. Again, Palestine is the area that is the spot that the Zionists are saying should be this homeland. There's already Jewish enclaves put there. It is the historical site uh, of where the Jewish homeland had been. And what will end up happening is, is that you have the United Nations, which is a successor organization to the League of Nations being formed. And the United Nations is ostensibly set up to ensure that there's not going to be a, another world war taking place. That countries that already exist in countries that will be formed from the former colonies of Europe, they will be represented too. And hopefully the United Nations will be an international body that will head off future war and prevent things like the Holocaust and ethnic cleansing and genocides from taking place in the future. At the end of World War II, Britain is still in control of Mandate Palestine. And they are still trying to figure out what to do. Now that the war is over, and now that they've seen what has happened inside Europe, the aftermath of the Holocaust, and they are still trying to figure out a way in order to split the territory as evenly as possible between the Zionists and between the Arabs. And from 1945 to 1947, early 1947, you have a guerrilla war that takes place in Palestine. And it is not just the Palestinian Arabs who are taking part in this. You have several groups, uh, several Zionist groups, that are going to be complicit okay, in these attacks. You have the Stern Gang in Ergen, which are demanding that the British withdraw from Palestine and allow this Jewish state to be created immediately. You have other Zionist groups that are looking at it as, we will most likely have a Jewish state soon. 
but we need to work within the diplomatic system that already exists. And so they do not support what the Stern Gang and Ergen are going to do. The Stern Gang and Ergen, they start to carry out attacks against both the Palestinian Arabs and the British. And they will also conduct bombings on the King David Hotel, where they kill a number of UN diplomats who are trying to negotiate the partition of the territory. They kidnap British soldiers and execute them, while the Palestinians or Palestinian Arabs are also doing some of these things. The British want to get out of Palestine. And what they decide to do is in the summer of 1947, the British government announces that it is ending okay, the Palestine mandate and that they are turning the region over to the United Nations. And it will be the United Nations that decides how this new state is going to be formed, whether it is one state or is partitioned into two. On November 29th, 1947, the UN General Assembly goes through and makes a vote where they decide that they will partition Palestine into Jewish and Arab states. And the way that they are going to split the country up territorially falls into the population densities of these two groups. So the Palestinian Arabs would have more of the territory than the Zionists would. Jerusalem is supposed to be an open city. Neither side is going to have uh, legal rights or political rights over that territory. Instead, the United Nations is supposed to oversee this city because it is so important to the three major monotheistic religions. It's supposed to be neutral ground. After the UN vote, what ends up happening is that you have envoys from both the Zionists and the Palestinians meeting uh, with the UN separately. The Palestinians believe that, they, that this is not a legitimate binding legal document. They refuse to sign it. They refuse to partition their territory. And so that opens the door for them to be disenfranchised from the territory. Because what will happen is, is that the, the Zionist Commission will actually sign the UN resolution. They will sign this accord, splitting the territory. The British are evacuating their soldiers, their diplomats, their civilians out of the territory. And they started this process in 1947. They say that they will complete it by the middle of May 1948. And this is where the conflict is going to, uh, the first Arab-Israeli uh, conflict is going to erupt. As soon as the last British forces and civilians are evacuated. On May 14th, 1948, David Ben-Gurion ends up declaring that the state of Israel has come into existence. He is going to be the country's first prime minister. He is going to be seen as the, the father of the modern state of Israel. When he's making this declaration in Tel Aviv, which is the uh, Israeli capital, behind him is a large picture uh, or a large painting of Theodor Herzl. So it is kind of, they're kind of bringing together the idea that this, the Zionist movement has come full circle. There was the need for the Jewish state, and now this Jewish state has been declared. The United States and the Soviet Union will recognize this state of Israel as being a legitimate political entity. In their view, they are now part of the international community. None of the Arab states around this territory recognize Israel. They say that the territory is Palestinian. This entity that is springing up in the territory that has declared itself the state of Israel is nothing more than an attempt by uh, Zionists and by Western Europeans and Americans as a means of controlling this territory. It's, an, it's a new kind of Western crusader state in their view that is being put together. Now, what ends up happening is that the American Secretary of State, George C. Marshall, who's also, he had been the chief of the general staff of the United States military forces in World War II, he tells U.S. President Harry Truman that, you know, maybe we should not recognize the state of Israel immediately. Uh, maybe we should see if this will be partitioned and see that if both sides will agree to the fact that the territory is split between them. Truman ignores Marshall, and he declares that the state of Israel is this new Jewish homeland and that the United States will support it in whatever enterprises it needs, whether it's economic or diplomatic or military. The U.S. and Israel will be tied to each other. 
what will end up happening in 1948 is a very brief period after the declaration of the state of Israel. You have the Haganah, the Zionist militia, becoming uh, the cornerstone of what will be the Israeli defense force, the IDF of today. What they are tasked with doing is going into the territory that is marked for this new state of Israel. And what they're supposed to do is push or, you know, tell the the local Palestinian Arabs that they need to leave this territory and go over the partition line. And that the property that they leave behind, whether it's their houses, their cars, their tractors, livestock, whatever it is, eventually maybe they will have a claim to reparation for it or they won't at all. The Palestinians who are there to a degree believe that what will happen is they'll be allowed to return home and they'll be able to get their property back. They'll either be able to move back in and stay in their original homes or they'll get some sort of recompense for it. Well, in the first few months after the the state of Israel is declared, the Haganah goes through the process of expelling as many Palestinians as they can, even in areas that are not legally recognized by the United Nations as part of the state of Israel. Between 1947 and 1949, roughly 775,000 Arabs are pushed out of their homelands, either across partition lines, where the state of Israel and a Palestinian state would be, or out of Palestine and Israel altogether into territories that will be Lebanon or Syria, Jordan or Egypt. And while they are allowed to come into these Arab states, many of those host countries will not allow the Palestinians to become citizens of state that is hosting them. They will not give them opportunities for education or economic or political power. And what ends up happening is these Palestinian refugee populations are trapped along the borders of these Arab states and what had been their homeland. And we're looking at, at this point, about four, maybe five generations worth of people that have been dispossessed and in many cases not allowed to participate in the new countries that they find themselves in. The only Arab state that grants the Palestinians citizenship is going to be Jordan. This first few months that Israel is kind of getting off the ground, the surrounding Arab states, uh, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, uh, they are starting to gather their armed forces and their governments are declaring that the state of Israel is not a legitimate political entity, that it is an occupied territory, and that the Muslim Arab states will basically push the Zionists into the sea. They will push the entire Jewish population, whether they are immigrants or, pe- or people who have lived there for generations. They will be destroyed. They will be pushed off this land and Palestine will be restored. There is already a tension among these supposedly Arab allies. The two most powerful Arab states at the time are the Kingdom of Egypt and the Kingdom of Jordan. Okay, So you have the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, you have an Egyptian kingdom that has gained its independence from Britain. In each of these territories, each of these kingdoms, is trying to be the leader of the Arab world. And the disagreements between the Jordanians and the Egyptians derail this first Arab-Israeli war. There is negotiations between the Jordanians and the Israelis uh, where they are actually partitioning what would have been left of this Palestinian state. The Jordanians make the agreement with the Israeli government in 48 and 49 that they will occupy what is called the West Bank. So it is the territory that is going to be on the west side of the River Jordan. It will include Jerusalem and many other areas that surround that. The Jordanian army will move up into that area and they will occupy it. But then they will not push against the Israeli army any further. So it's basically what it is. It is a token invasion uh, for the Israelis to be able to beat the Syrians, the Iraqis, the Lebanese, and the Egyptians. They were willing to give the West Bank over to Jordan in order to beat the other Arab states uh, and prevent them from overwhelming this new Israeli state. And the first Arab-Israeli war is a success for Israel. They are able to secure the territories that the UN had given them in the charter, and they had taken more territory. And then there was the question of what actually we do, do we do now? We've expelled all of these Palestinians. 
do we give them the ability to get reparations or to move back into the territory of this new state of Israel, or are they permanently expelled? And here's where things get even grayer. The Israeli government goes through the process of putting together several laws uh, that will define the character of this new country. There is what is called the Law of Return. This is one that states that anyone of Jewish descent from anywhere in the world can come to Israel and ask for citizenship and automatically be granted it. So you do not have to be born in Israel. You do not have to have parents who are born in Israel who emigrate somewhere else later. You can be from any country in the world, and as long as you are uh, Jewish, you are able to have citizenship, hold citizenship in Israel, and you don't necessarily have to live there all year round. There's another law that was passed, okay, and that is a law that sets down a census of the population of the state of Israel, and it is done after the expulsion of the Palestinian Arabs. What this census does is it basically disenfranchises all of those Palestinian Arabs from being citizens of Israel. The state of Israel, when it first forms in 1948, is not exclusively Jewish. There are Jews, there are Christians, there are Muslims who still live in that territory. But the ones who left before the, these laws were passed and finalized in 1949 are not allowed to come back home. So any property that you could not carry out with you when you were being forced across the partition border, that is lost to those Palestinians. There is no financial recompense for houses or orchards, farms, factories, anything and everything that was left behind. That is, they no longer have a legal claim to that, according to the state of Israel. The property that's left, that was left behind by those people is viewed as abandoned, according to Israeli law. The European Jews who survived the Holocaust, many will go to Israel. A lot of that property will go to those people in order to help them start their lives back up. And there is a split in the Zionist community over whether this should have happened or not. Like any political ideology, there are splits depending on how far you are willing to go in different things. The more moderate Zionists were saying that to expel the Palestinians means that we are doing to these people what others have done to us for centuries. You are ethnically cleansing them from this territory. You are forcing them to abandon their home and never be allowed to return. The moderates were looking at it as after the state of Israel is set up, or as the state of Israel is being set up, don't arbitrarily force the Palestinians out. Try to figure out a way to bring them in to this new state so that there's not the conflict. For the hardliners and the Zionists, there were some who believed that there should not be any Palestinians in the territory at all. All of them should be expelled, regardless, and that this new state of Israel should be strictly a Jewish religious state. The territory that would have encompassed the new state of this modern Israel, uh, in the view of the, the extreme uh, Zionists, they were called uh, maximalists, meaning that they believed that this new state of Israel should be as large as what the kingdom of David and Solomon uh, during this united monarchy period would have been. And there was no real way to justify how large that territory was. Was it just the state of Palestine? Or did it include parts of Jordan and parts of Syria and parts of Lebanon and parts of Egypt? If that's the case, do you expel the Arab populations that are living in those territories? Are those countries going to be willing to surrender that territory? Which they are not. The minimalists were along the lines of, we keep the territory that the United Nations gave to us, and we stay with that. We allow Palestinians to have their, what would be left of their rump state, and they would be their own political entity. Ultimately, the Palestinian state, because the West Bank had been the core of what was supposed to be the Palestinian state, and that was absorbed by Jordan, the, Pal the Palestinian state, the Palestinian partition, never took place. So you have the start of this new country of Israel 
where there is already a split in the the Jewish population over what should be done and how the state should be set up and what should happen with the Palestinians. And then you have the Palestinians themselves who now feel betrayed by the Arab countries who were supposed to help them to push the Zionists out and mad at the Jordanians because they took over what should have been the bulk of this Palestinian state. And they realize that they are nothing more than political capital for the governments in Damascus, in Amman, in Cairo. While the Syrians and Jordanians and Egyptians say that they will fight to push and liberate uh, Palestine, they will not, for the most part, allow the Palestinians to be absorbed into their populations. So the Palestinians are stuck in these refugee camps. Uh, If they have the ability, they leave to go to the United States or to Europe. But for the most part, they are displaced people from 1947 onwards. And the situation in the area becomes more and more tense. The Arab states ask Western Europe and the United States for military aid. They want Western jets and tanks and artillery pieces in order to defend themselves, in their view, against this new Israeli state. And for the most part, they are denied that. They will be given economic aid, but military aid, in a much greater sense of economic aid, will come from the Soviet Union from the 1950s onwards. And the Middle East becomes another element in the Cold War. You have the Suez Crisis that takes place in 1956, and this is caused when Nasser, who is the leader of Egypt, decides that he is going to nationalize the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal was split in ownership between the British, the French, and the Egyptians. But most of the money that was the tariffs that were being generated with, by trade coming through the Suez Canal were going to Britain and France instead of going to Egypt. Uh, and the Egyptian economy was trying to develop into a, a, a more industrialized and modern state. Nasser wanted to build the high Aswan Dam as well. He wanted to give cheap hydroelectric power and the ability to give year-round irrigation to the Egyptians. And he could not raise enough domestically to cover the cost of this. And so when he reached out to Western banks and they said no, he decided that the best way to raise the funds was to seize control of the Suez Canal and make it strictly Egyptian so that the money that was generated through those tariffs and taxes would go to the Egyptians and allow them to develop economically and socially instead of having the money go to British and French banks. That became a major issue for France and Britain because they still controlled territories uh, in Africa and in the Far East, and losing uh, control of the Suez Canal would make it harder for them to shift military forces to put down rebellions and insurrections in African and Asian colonies. Britain and France approach the Israeli government, asking if they would be interested in conducting a joint operation. Britain and France would launch airborne assaults to seize the Suez Canal, and the Egyptians would be able to uh, would not be able to fend them off, but to get some more support from Israel and the potential that the British and French could use Israeli airfields, they would allow the Israelis to take over the Gaza Strip to move into the Sinai Peninsula, which is that kind of triangular piece of land that connects Egypt with the Middle East, and the Israelis agree. And this joint operation goes off very well when it is launched. The British, French, and Israeli air forces destroy the Egyptian air force on the ground. British paratroopers and French paratroopers land at different points along the Suez Canal and seize control of it. The Israeli IDF moves into the Gaza Strip and starts moving into the Sinai Peninsula. And then there's an international crisis. Egypt goes to the United Nations and says that it has been attacked, unprovoked. And the United Nations agrees with it. The Soviet Union and the United States force the British and French to evacuate their forces from the, Zubet, from the Suez Canal and recognize that Egypt is in control of that area and that their unilateral actions to force either former colonial possessions or current colonial possessions to conform, those days are at an end. And so what happens is that the 
British and French withdraw, which forces the Israelis to withdraw from the territory that they had taken, and it makes the surrounding Arab states view Israel as even more of a threat. It also pushes Egypt, Syria, and Iraq, and to a degree, a little bit of Jordan, closer to the Soviet Union. Jordan kind of tries to stay neutral, and it does quite well. But Egypt, Syria, and Iraq go closer and closer to the Soviet Union, and they're getting more and more weapons. They're getting advisors to train their soldiers how to use them. They're getting money to complete things like the Aswan High Dam, as well as money and resources being sent from the Soviet Union to bolster their economies. That's going to lead us to 1967, which is going to be the Six-Day War, which is where the situation in the Middle East becomes even more fracturous, it becomes even more of a powder keg for future war. And what this involves is Egypt and Syria. They have rearmed with Soviet weapons. And they are beginning to come up with a plan to attack Israel from both the south and the north at the same time, hoping to overwhelm the Israeli defense force. Jordan is neutral. It does not want to be allied with Syria and Egypt. Uh, King Abdullah who had been the king of Jordan since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, uh, up to the actual uh, Israeli War of Independence, he is assassinated after Israel is able to beat the Arab states around them. He is killed, and there are reliable sources that say that it was actions from the Syrian and Egyptian intelligence communities that helped put the assassination together and actually execute it. So the Jordanians are to a degree viewed as traitors by the fellow Arabs, and they just kind of want to be left out of any future conflict. When Israel finds out that Egypt and Syria are moving military forces close to the Israeli border, the Israeli government and military decide that if there's going to be a war, it is better that Israel be the one to strike first. They want to launch a preemptive war. The idea behind it is to destroy the Egyptian and Syrian air forces on the ground and then use the Israeli air force and army to destroy the Syrian and Egyptian army at the same time. When Jordan will not confirm to the Israelis that they are going to stay neutral in this conflict, Jordan is added to the list of hostile countries by Israel. When the Six-Day War hits, it is a massive war. It's going to take place in June of 1967, and the Israelis end up destroying the Egyptian, Jordanian, and Syrian air forces on the ground. The Arab air forces do not get any other fighters or bombers into the air. They're destroyed on the runways, and then what ends up happening is that the Israelis had positioned units of their army in different areas, and once the Arab air forces were destroyed, they were able to dominate both the air and the land. And what will end up happening is the Israelis, when they take, they make the jump against the Egyptians, they are able to push out of southern Israel and overrun the Gaza Strip. They overrun the entire Sinai Peninsula, and there are Israeli forces that are that meet the, that get to the Suez Canal and then start crossing the Nile River and are on their way to Cairo, which is the Egyptian capital. There is an Israeli army that is in the north that is pushing out of the northeastern part of Israel and occupies the Golan Heights, which is kind of this mountainous hilly region that separates Israel from Syria. And this Israeli army occupies all the Golan Heights and then starts pushing towards Damascus, which is the Syrian capital. The Jordanians did not have their military set up in any way to fight against the Israelis because they had not been expected to be in this war. So when the Israelis wipe their air force out, there is really no Jordanian response that they can muster. The Israeli army that is in the east facing the West Bank overruns the entirety of the West Bank and pushes up to the Jordan River and ends up occupying that area. The United Nations calls for a ceasefire, which the Israelis give after the six days are up, and they have increased Israel's territory by almost 45%. For the area of the West Bank, that is where most of the Palestinian refugees from 1947 and 1948 have been concentrated. So a large chunk of the population that had been expelled is now reabsorbed into Israel. The Gaza Strip is the same thing. The Egyptians had allowed Palestinians to escape, and they had been mostly contained in that region. Now most of them are back under Israeli control. 
And Israel refuses to relinquish the territory that is taken from these Arab states. Basically what they say is that these territories are now part of Israel. For the Arabs and for the Palestinians, the Golan Heights, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip are considered the occupied territories now. And so the Palestinian populations that are in these areas are basically back under the control of Israel, and there is really no plan as to what to do with them. This is a period where you start to see the Arab political organizations, whether it's the governments of Syria and Jordan and Egypt, basically losing credibility in the eyes of the Palestinians of being able to liberate their homeland or to put their case to the UN in order to have the Palestinians recognized as a legitimate entity. And instead, what will happen is you start to see the rise of Palestinian religious groups and resistance groups forming that will spearhead uh, the idea of keeping the Palestinian liberation alive. This is where you have Yasser Arafat forming the Palestinian Liberation Organization, or the PLO. And this is going to be a combination of a political organization and a terrorist organization. The PLO will hijack airplanes, uh, they'll hijack cruise ships, and they will force the world to see that the Palestinian situation has not been improved at all. They're putting it back in the public spotlight. And what will happen is, is that the PLO will be in the eyes of the Palestinians, one of the, in the 70s and 80s at least, the only legitimate Palestinian organization that is keeping the idea of Palestine in the worldview. While it's done through terrorism, and it is, they do conduct, in many cases, horrific attacks, they are effective in forcing the world to see that there is still an issue taking place uh, in Israel. Fast forward to 1973, and this is where you have the Yom Kippur War. This is going to take place uh, in October 1973, and this is a surprise attack by Egypt and Syria against Israel. They decide to strike at Yom Kippur because this is one of the major Jewish holidays. They know that much of the Israeli defense force is going to be on leave, and any time that the Israeli army has to call up its reservists, it is stopping the Israeli economy in its tracks because those reservists are leaving the private sector and going into the military. So it is expensive. It is disruptive to Israeli society to have to constantly have these soldiers uh, being called up. So when the reserves are released, the Syrians and the Egyptians launch their surprise attack. They have figured out a very successful way of stopping the IDF in its tracks in terms of counterattacks. The Soviets have given the Egyptians and the Syrians their most advanced anti-tank weapons and most advanced anti-aircraft systems. So when the Egyptians and Syrians launch their attacks, there is an area where they are going to be protected against Israeli aircraft and helicopters and Israeli tanks. They go up to as far as that range is, and then they stop and they dig in. And they'll, what will happen is the IDF, the units that are still active, that are near those borders, when they try to counterattack, they are ground down, where they are not able to push them, the Egyptians or the Syrians back initially. It is not until the reservists come back and that there is major reinforcement of the IDF by the United States by sending in equipment and munitions and fuel to keep the Israelis going that the Israelis are able to push their counterattack and push the Syrians and the Egyptians back over the 1967 border. And then there is the potential threat of a wider war taking place. The, the Egyptians and the Syrians ask the Soviets to put pressure on the Israelis to stop them from conquering Damascus and Cairo. And the Soviet Union puts the threat out that if Israel will not stop at its own, then the Soviet Union will stop Israel. Which means that there's the potential that the Soviet Union does something in terms of military power or some other thing that will force the Israelis to stop. That is a threat to the United States because Israel is one of the U.S.'s allies in the Middle East. And so in October 1973, there's an escalation where it looks like the Soviet Union and their allies 
will be going to war against the United States and their allies. But cooler heads prevail, and what ends up happening is that there is uh, a ceasefire. The Israelis agree to give the Sinai Peninsula back to Egypt, but the Israelis will keep the Gaza Strip. The Israelis will keep the Golan Heights, but they will not push on towards Damascus. Jordan, by that point in time, after the 1967 war, they had actually recognized Israel. They're the first Arab state to say that Israel is a real state 20 years after it's been declared. You have uh, President Sadat of Egypt, who goes to the United States to meet with the American president and with the Israeli prime minister, and they will go through the process of officially recognizing Israel as well. When Sadat goes back to Egypt, He is assassinated by members of his own military during a parade because they view him as betraying their fellow Muslims and the Palestinians. Uh, This is where you have uh, Mubarak come in as military dictator of Egypt from the death of Sadat all the way to his overthrow in 2011. With the Egyptians normalizing their relationship with Israel, the Egyptians say they will not support the Palestinians. They will not support the PLO in terrorist operations against Israel. And in theory, the Egyptians and the Israeli intelligence communities will work together in order to stop terrorist attacks happening inside their territory. Syria, still to this day, does not recognize Israel as a legitimate country. And they st- that is why they still have such a hostile relationship with Israel, is that neither state is willing to give the other any sort of leeway. Uh, Syria will go through the process of funding uh, and aiding the PLO and other offshoot uh, organizations in continuing the fight against Israel. Now, the PLO is still conducting hijackings. Uh, There are members of the group that have gone through and killed Israeli athletes. There are a number of... uh, There's also a terrorist attack in London. And what will happen is that eventually Yasser Arafat, who's the leader of the PLO, he will eventually go from the leader of this organization in terms of a a terrorist playboy to more of a traditional politician. He is seeing that many of the states that had formally allied or had been friendly with the PLO are no longer there. Jordan ends up expelling the PLO out of its territory, and the majority of it end up winding up in southern Lebanon. Some of it end up going into uh, the occupied West Bank. Some of it go to the occupied Gaza Strip. Over time, what happens is the PLO fragments in the 1990s and early 2000s. And what will end up happening is that while Yasser Arafat and the PLO, the core of it, morph into the Palestinian Authority and become, to a degree, recognized by the Israeli state as the Palestinian government in exile. And even the UN and some other places will recognize it. There are elements of the PLO that refuse to negotiate. They refuse to be part of the partition of Palestine. These are going to be Hezbollah, who will be in southern Lebanon, and they are heavily supported by Syria. Uh, in terms of finance and military equipment. And then there's going to be Hamas that ends up forming in the Gaza Strip. And they are going to be heavily supported by Iran, financially and militarily. These two groups do not recognize the state of Israel as existing, and they also do not recognize the authority of the Palestinian Authority. They do not view that as a legitimate governing body. They see themselves as the only Palestinian body. Hamas makes a clear declaration of what they are. They are a resistance group that will never stop fighting against Israel or any other power that backs them up until Palestine is completely liberated and there are no longer any Jews in that territory. Now, what Hamas will do for a lot of their attacks is instead of hijacking airplanes, one of their favorite tactics is either firing rockets in the southern and central Israel or more horrifically, they will use human suicide bombers to go into public places, whether they're restaurants or buses or theaters or even just street markets, and detonate explosives and kill themselves and anyone who's around them. And these attacks occur all throughout Israel. But that is not saying that it is strictly the Palestinians who are at fault. You have Israeli extremists 
who are also viewing what the Israeli government is doing incorrect. For the extremist Israelis, they are looking at even the occupied territories as being strictly for Jewish settlement. So the Palestinian Arabs who are in the Gaza Strip, that are in the West Bank, that are in the Golan Heights, they should be completely expelled, as well as other Palestinians throughout Israel. And there will actually be uh, an Israeli prime minister who is going to be assassinated, Yitzhak Rabin. He had met with Yasser Arafat, and they had actually gone through the process of formally recognizing the Israeli government, recognized the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority recognized the state and government of Egypt as being legitimate. And what will end up happening with Rabin is while he goes to a rally, there's one of these extremist Israelis who comes up and shoots him in the chest and kills him for, in his view, betraying the state of Israel. There are, over the course of the state of Israel forming from 47 into the early 1990s, the Israelis, when there were raids by Palestinians on the villages or on airplanes, there was this concept of mass retaliation or retaliation out of proportion to what happened. And so, in some cases, if there was a Jewish settlement that was attacked, a Palestinian settlement was attacked the next night. And usually it was a much higher death toll. Well, as the Palestinian Authority starts to lose its legitimacy with the Palestinian people, Hamas and Hezbollah start to become more and more recognized as being the face of the resistance to Israel. And even moderate Palestinians... While they don't maybe necessarily agree with everything that Hezbollah and Hamas do, they do recognize that these two terrorist organizations are still keeping the Palestinians in the world's view. As there are more and more attacks uh, coming from Hezbollah, whether it's in the West Bank or it's in Gaza, what the Israeli government does in response is it starts to wall off the areas where Palestinians are located at. And so you start to... to see a comparison to what happened in South Africa in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and mid-1980s, where you can make the argument that Israel is pushing uh, an apartheid state policy, meaning that portions of the population, the Palestinian portion of the Israeli population, is not given the same civil and legal protections, and that in some cases they're not allowed to be in the economic or educational or political spheres that uh, Israelis are allowed, Jewish Israelis are allowed to have. Uh, basically, what will end up happening uh, is the you will have uh, schools for Israelis set up and schools for Palestinians set up. So uh, same thing with uh, government agencies, health care. There's a split between the society. And it heavily favors the Israeli over the Palestinian. And over the course of decades, that is another cause for why uh, these terrorist organizations are, if for many people, they're not necessarily viewed in Palestine, in the Palestinian community, as being correct. Okay, the idea is that they're not necessarily interested in perpetuating ethnic cleansing. Most Palestinians just basically, they want to be left to their own devices. They want their own state. They want their own legal and economic and social protections like anyone else. But most Palestinians are powerless in that. And it is the extremists, the ones who are joining Hezbollah and Hamas, who are pushing the policies and pushing violence in order to perpetuate the destruction of Israelis and Palestinians. There's really no easy way for this conflict to end in a way that is amicable to either side. There is no black and white, right or wrong answer to what is happening in this conflict. Both sides have had legitimate issues and legitimate uh, complaints about what is going on. Both sides have ignored the international community when it comes to trying to have an actual successful mediation of the issues. Both sides have conducted or uh, had atrocities committed against the other. 
And even the international community is complicit in this because we have not forced these two peoples to actually go to a negotiating table and work out a solution to what is going on. I'm not saying that this is going to be an easy solution. Neither side wants to see this territory partitioned. Uh, we hear in the news all the time the idea of what a two-state solution would be, splitting the territory between an Israeli state and a Palestinian state. Neither side is really willing to go through that process because neither side is willing to lose the rest of that territory. Both of them claim that that is their homeland. Both of them claim that they are historically from this region and that neither has the right or historical precedent to displace the other. And so what we have seen from 1900 onwards is a continuing escalating cycle of violence between these groups, not only in that territory, but also having interference from the neighboring states because it gives them the ability to flex their domestic and foreign muscle by saying that they are either the champion of the Palestinians or the champion of the Israelis. And as long as both sides are allowed by their patrons to do whatever it is they wish to the other, there's never going to be peace in this area. I wish that I could tell you that this would be something that could be solved with a handshake. As foolish as that sounds, the idea that people will be able to look past the transgressions of history, the marks against each other, and be able to see that we all need to move forward. And we all need to be able to recognize the injustices of the past and try to rectify them, but not let those poison what the future and the present are going to be. So this is just, to a degree, a basic history of what has happened up to this point. And it is not a complete history. It is not, it does not touch on even the surface of the tensions and the issues that have taken place in this region. And it is not a, this is not a discussion to say one side or the other is right or wrong. This is hopefully a way to let you, the listener, know what some of the conflict, the historical context of this area is, in hope that it will make you want to understand more of what has happened and look at both sides and realize that both do have legitimate concerns and legitimate reasons for being there and that hopefully level our heads will prevail and that this will not be the start of another round of Arab and Israeli warfare and will not spark off a larger regional or perhaps world conflict. If you have any questions or you would like more information by all means reach out to us okay send messages to our facebook page history with the Slogies, or send messages to either chrissy or i on x what used to be twitter uh, you could send messages to me at jason dark elf at twitter uh, the goddess livia at on twitter for chrissy if you want to have further discussion more elaboration on events that took that are taking place now or took place in the past uh, for Israel-Palestine, send us a message. I'm not saying that we have all the answers or that we are perfect in our explanation of what is going on, but I implore you to learn more. Find out what is happening in the world around you so that you have a better understanding of what you're hearing in a podcast or on the news or seeing on TV or an article online. The more you understand, or the more that you have a connection to what is happening in the world, the more that you're informed, and hopefully that you'll be able to make an informed decision on what is happening. With that appeal, I want to say that my sympathies go out to the people of Israel, and my sympathies go out to the Palestinian people as well, those who are not members of Hamas or Hezbollah, those people who are just regular souls trapped in this cycle who cannot break free and hopefully they will be able to find a solution that is not through military means hopefully we'll get lasting peace somewhere